that in this town, so many of us grow up believing that we're just one big idea away from killing the game. In fact, many of us know someone who knows someone who struck it stinking rich while innovating a product or service that changes the way the whole world lives. The whole world. But there's another side to the razzle-dazzle of this valley, isn't there? And that's because for every person that is in fact killing the game, there are hundreds of thousands of others who feel like the game is killing them. While grinding to make our mark and pay these ridiculous housing prices, we feel like we have to go all in for work, which by default pretty much leaves us all out of our relationships, our physical well-being, and any semblance of a pursuit of joy. The grind, you guys, is not sustainable. It leaves us feeling sick, lonely, and freaking miserable. Even local doctors are starting to take note of it. Dr. Ranesh Sinha of Palo Alto Medical Foundation was quoted in a Forbes magazine article as saying that his 30-year-old patients are presenting with 50-year-old bodies, complete with pot belly, curved spine, dulled skin tone, reduced vitality, and an increased risk of diabetes and heart disease. And that's just the physical side of it. Then there's the emotional. That part can be summed up best by an engineer who was quoted in a Quartz Magazine article as saying, the grind can get to anyone. We push back drinks with friends, miss birthday parties, and skip family vacations. And eventually, the invitations themselves start to taper off, and a sense of isolation sinks in. Now, I'm guessing you can relate to this, either for yourself or for somebody you care about. Whether it's work, even if it's work you love, but that occupies every waking moment of your day. Or it's the all-sitting, all-the-time lifestyle that just leaves you feeling, uh. Or it's the loneliness, because you've left so many of your relationships collecting dust on a shelf that it feels too late to try to re-engage. Or it's because you spend so much of your free time on your cell phone, sort of living vicariously through other people's adventures instead of having any of your own. I know each one of these kinds of pains intimately. And when it sticks around long enough, I like to call it misery as motivator. And it visited me just over a year ago. At the time, I was working at a Silicon Valley school that charges $40,000 a year for one-on-one -on -one instruction for kids. Now, for me as a teacher, this meant that between the hours of 9 and 5, I would see one student on top of every hour with 10 minutes in between to frantically type in notes. I would have no time to engage with my peers, and I would never see any natural daylight. I was in a dimly lit little office. And then after the last kid left, it was time to make lesson plans and create my own materials. Because even though they were charging $40,000 a year, they weren't spending that on the teachers or the curriculum. So I would get home at the end of every day feeling depleted and frankly resentful. I would come home, eat dinner, scroll through my newsfeed, living vicariously through other people's adventures instead of having any of my own. And I'd ask myself, is this really all there is? Now fortunately for me, I clawed my way out of that situation. And it occurred to me that the mindset shifts and actions I took are applicable to anybody who's suffering from the grind. So I'm here today to share my ideas with you. And I even came up with a clever little name for it. I'm calling it Silicon, your antidote to the Silicon Valley grind. I came up with the name, um, believe it or not, when I learned that there was a product on the market called Narcan, which is an antidote for an opioid overdose. And then I heard that the very same people who make that antidote are the ones who make the opioids that are killing people in the first place. And I thought, all right, you sneaky snakes, two can play at that game. Because I contend, you guys, that every single one of us in this room who is available for work on their cell phone 24-7 is contributing to this grind culture, this culture that's leaving us feeling sick, lonely, and freaking miserable. And if we're going to be invested in the culture that's killing us, then we better be invested in creating our own antidote so that instead we can feel well connected and freaking awesome. So here are the three ingredients that I think will help you neutralize the grind. Ingredient number one is balance. 
Now, for those of you neck deep in the, the grind culture, I'm sure you're thinking, oh, fantastic. Balance? What's ingredient number two to capture a new unicorn? But here's the thing. I believe that the single best way to defeat the grind is to commit to a weekly practice of balance. Would it be ideal to experience balance every day? Absolutely, but it just isn't that realistic. So I think for the sense of our well-being, we need to commit in a seven-day period of time that we will serve each one of our key areas of self within that time period. Now, to that end, in my coaching practice, I use these game board pieces from the game Candyland, and I put them out on a table in my office, each one representing a key area of self. And I move them forward and back as my clients check in with me so that they can have like a visual representation of what parts of themselves they're leaving behind so they can decide where they want to do the work. The first key area of self is our career or intellectual self. It is represented by the color green, the color of the almighty dollar. It is a part of ourself that is overserved in Silicon Valley. It is important, but it isn't everything. When we practice it, we feel growth-minded, we feel mentally stimulated, we feel relevant, if not downright promotable in our work, we feel interested in the world around us, and interesting for people to talk to. The second key area of self is our physical self represented by the color yellow, the color of the sun, because it's where we get our energy. It includes sleep, nutrition, exercise, and seeing the doctor regularly so that anything small brewing within us can be dealt with before it becomes a life-changing problem. When we don't take care of our physical self, we feel tired, grumpy, lethargic, frumpy. But when we do take care of our physical self, we feel rested, strong, energetic, maybe even frisky. The next key area of self is our relationship self. It is represented by the color red, the color of heart and love. You guys, we all need a village of people around us. For introverts, that village will be small. For extroverts, it will be larger. But we all need to know that on our, ooh, sorry, on our very worst day, people are going to come running. Pick us up off the floor and make us know it's going to be okay. And on our best day, we need to know that those same people are going to come running to celebrate our win with us. And every day in between, they're going to be there to validate the journey. So how do we feel when we don't manage our relationship? We often experience drama because turns out people do not like to be ignored. We also can experience loneliness and isolation because people will move on to find someone who will value them with their time and energy if we're not willing to do that. But when we do manage our relationships, we feel connected, secure, loved. The last key area of self is our emotional or joy self, represented by the color blue. I chose blue for this one because, frankly, it was the last color left but also because we feel blue when we don't experience joy. This one gives me goosebumps, you guys. When I talk to people and I say, if the goal is to like, like your life better, what are your go-to moves that make you feel happier? And I look at people and they just kind of stare back at me like, I'm so out of touch with that, I don't even know. I think we all need to be able to lift our five go-to moves to lift our spirits. For me, it's a walk on the beach. It's catching a sunset. It's enjoying a meal on a patio with people I love. It's creative writing. It's listening to books and podcasts that fill my brain with possibility and positivity because it's the food my brain needs. What are your five? Because if you can't name them, you're probably not going to practice them. And if you don't practice them, you're going to feel resentful, sad, depressed. But if you do practice them, you'll have that ah moment of, yes, I got to do this thing. And you're also going to have kind of a carryover spring in your step, a twinkle in your eye. that You're going to carry back to your relationships because we treat our people better when we feel happy. You treat your body better when you feel happy. And you have a better attitude about all the work that needs to be done if you're looking forward to some in the immediate future. So all of these pieces of self 
are equally important, not just the green one. We have to move all of them forward in some sort of harmony so that life feels sustainable and enjoyable. Ingredient number two is boundaries. As I mentioned before, we need that village of people around us. But to get to that level of connection with people requires a huge weeding out process. And sometimes we lose good people along the way due to silly dramas that get out of hand. And sometimes we keep people around out of a shared sense of history, even though they no longer serve the person we are now or the person we want to become. And as I was pondering this, I ran across a quote by motivational speaker Jim Rohn, who says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. The first time I heard that quote, it was like, whoa, who are my five people? And what do they say about me and where I'm going? So I'm wondering who your five people are. Are these people happy for you to grow? Or do they have a vested interest in you staying just where you are because of how it impacts them? Now I realize talking about pe the people you surround yourself with sounds an awful lot like the peer pressure conversation. And if you're a teenager in the room, I'm sure you just rolled your eye. And I don't blame you because I did the same thing when I was in high school. The thing is I'm not as concerned about peer pressure as I am about peer normalizing. Because the thing about peer pressure is it's pretty overt. If you go to a party and someone says, drink, 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 you're like, I see what you're doing there. No, no, no. So you don't want to. But peer normalizing is far more insidious. It becomes what we, what we surround ourselves with becomes what we think normal is, what everyone is doing. It becomes our little microculture. So again, if you're in high school and you have a bunch of friends who don't really care about school, don't want to get a job, get high a lot, play video games all day, then you think that's what everyone is doing because that's your normal. That's your everyone. So if your parents get on your back and say, hey, you got to do some work here, you're like, mom, dad, relax. This is high school. This is what everyone does. Even though there are plenty of circles all around you of people that are engaged in healthier, more growth-minded behavior. Now, we parents don't get away with this either. We spend an awful lot of time thinking about who influences our children. But do we think about who's influencing us? Is anyone minding that gate? Just ask ourselves, are the people I'm surrounding myself with hungry to grow and learn new things? Are they moderate in their approach to eating and drinking? Do they get enough sleep and exercise? Do they pursue joy in healthy ways? Because it matters just as much for us as it does our children. And when students and parents alike walk toward people who are hungry to grow, then it's easier for that to be the norm, the expectation for ourselves in our own growth. The other kind of boundary that I'm really interested in is the input that we allow into our day. If you're like me, you wake up every morning with tons of notifications from news stories that happened while you were sleeping. Kind of a survey of the worst the world had to offer while I was asleep, right? And then if you get into the comment section of these stories, dear Lord, you might as well stay in fetal position all day, right? I mean. And then we segue into our work day with all the pressures and stresses there. And then we get little pings of calls and texts from people we care about, some of whom may be suffering. That takes us to about dinner time. And we've taken in a lot of heavy stuff all day long. And so I think those sacred hours between dinner and falling asleep, please tell me you're not working till the very last minute. But tell me that you're very mindful of what input you're allowing in. Because there's a lot of hard stuff that needs to get some balance. So whether it be podcasts or books that ignite your spirit, comedies or shows about people pursuing a dream, something to help balance out the load on your psyche before you go to bed each night. Ingredient number three, bravery. Bravery is a tricky word for me because I always think about the first responders who are flying in a place that I want to get the heck out of. So they're definitely brave. But I prefer to call them heroes so that leaves this word brave for how you and I show up in our everyday lives. And I think there's two, there are two ways we need to do that. The first is in our authenticity. If you ever go to the app store and see how many editing apps there are that allow us to dramatically 
alter our appearance and how we portray ourselves online. And I think it's a really dangerous thing to do because eventually, unless all your followers are overseas, you're going to have to walk past these people and they might not even recognize you, right? And as awkward and funny as that is, what you're telling those people is, yep, I'm cool with lying about who I am. And if you're cool with lying about your physical self, are you also going to edit your values and interests to fit in with whoever the person is in front of you? If we want to build this village of people we need, we need to show up authentically as we are so that the right people come forward and the others carry on their way. The second way we need to be brave is in how we take risks. We need to say yes when we want to say yes, no when we want to say no. We need to ask someone on a date, pursue a new friend, put our hat in the ring for an audition or an interview or a promotion. We need to do that because it makes us feel alive. We're moving forward. It captures our imagination. It makes living feel very alive. The alternative, uh oh. The alternative is to sit in a world of no. And that world of no may feel very comfortable and very safe, but eventually it's going to start feeling boring. And then boring is going to start feeling stagnating. And stagnating is going to feel an awful lot like rotting. And somewhere along the way, we are going to lose our confidence in trying to move forward and try new things. So we owe it to ourselves to keep moving forward to feel alive. So to sum it all up, ingredient number one was balance, serving each key part of ourself within a week's time. Ingredient number two is boundaries, being very mindful of who we let in and what we let in and who and what we leave out. And lastly, it's bravery. Bravery in being who we really are so the right people stick around and bravery in taking risks so that we feel alive. And when we do all of that, you guys, we don't need to sit around and wait for someone to Amazon Prime us a life we love. We can just step right out and fight for it. Thank you.